Thank you, Sam. I'm delighted to be here, everybody. I want to thank NATF and everyone for inviting me to speak. Uh, Sam knows to put me last on the agenda because I usually go far over the allotted amount of time. Uh, so uh, since I am the last speaker, I'll try to be very brief. Um, few conflicts of interest. So DOACs. DOACs are at least non-inferior in efficacy to warfarin or vitamin K antagonists. That's the worst thing we can say. In some situations, they're actually superior with regard to efficacy, but the worst we can say about how well they prevent VTE or treat VTE or prevent stroke and non valve fib is they're non-inferior. Despite the public's perception, DOACs actually have decreased rates of bleeding compared to warfarin. When you're looking overall at composite uh, bleeding, both major and minor, clinically relevant non-major bleeding, DOACs have a lower rate of bleeding. However, the public's perception is that this is not the case. Um, today, we approached, a, a, I'm running a cancer VTE study looking at DOACs versus standard of care, low molecular weight heparin. We approached a patient today to try to enroll him in the study. Um, we were going to pick a Pixaban Eliquis because for this patient it was the appropriate uh, drug. And the patient said, no, I've seen those commercials on TV. I, I don't want to go near a DOAC. I'm, I'm going to stick with low molecular weight heparin because that's what my community doctor told me I should use. So despite the fact that there had previously been no reversal agents for DOACs, both case fatality rates and, and mortality overall have been lower uh, with DOACs. And this is before specific reversal agents had been developed. So if you have your patient who is on a DOAC and they prevent with bleeding, which may or may not be related to the DOAC, you do what, you take the steps that you take with any patient who presents with bleeding, whether it's bleeding on warfarin, bleeding due to trauma, you do the basics. You stop the anticoagulant, you assess the severity, you check some labs, you do the standard supportive measures. But then you're faced with the question with your patient on an anticoagulant, do you need to immediately reverse anticoagulation in this patient? And that's a key question that I want everyone to remember when you're faced with somebody who comes in with bleeding. How severe is the bleeding? Is it life-threatening? Can you stabilize the patient and wait for the effects of the anticoagulant to wear off? Remember, DOACs are not like warfarin. Warfarin can take five days to reach you know, an INR of 1.0. Most DOACs have a half-life between 9 to 10, 9 to 12 hours. So, and most patients who've presented with bleeding are usually already one half-life into the drug. It takes five half-lives for all of the drug to disappear from the system. So keep that in mind when you're faced with somebody who has moderate bleeding or minor bleeding. Do you really need to reverse the anticoagulant? I get asked frequently about coagulation tests, and this is why this, this non sequitur slide is, is here. Um, you have tests in your hospital that are available that can tell you whether or not there is significant anticoagulant activity on board in your patient. It's not going to tell you the concentration. It's not going to be um, a useful in, in determining um, just how much anticoagulation is on board because these tests right now are not standardized for amount of anticoagulant in their blood, but they can give you an idea and they can give you, you can follow these tests over time uh, in your patients. So if you have a patient on dabigatran, your lab has a thrombin time, you can check this in patients on dabigatran. And if your patient is on a 10A inhibitor, a factor 10A inhibitor, rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, all direct uh, inhibitors of factor 10, you can check the anti-10A level in your lab that you would use for unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. And when I get asked about um, checking levels and how do I know if there's anticoagulation on board in this patient, and they took their rivaroxaban last night, but they're here for surgery today, when we check these levels, we get astronomically high levels, and people panic. Physicians and caregivers panic. Do not panic. You may get a level of 7. You may get a level of 11 using your low molecular weight heparin anti-10A level for a patient on rivaroxaban when we're used to thinking of 0 0.5 to 1 for uh, low molecular weight heparin. does not mean your patient is going to have bleeding. It does not correlate uh, in that fashion. So I've used this slide of nonspecific reversal approaches uh, for over five years. And I used it in the past because we did not have targeted specific reversal agents for the DOACs. Um, 
I've given or I know of giving oral charcoal uh, to patients, I think, once in the last four years. Uh, hemodialysis used once in the last five years in the uh, Brigham Partners system. Uh, this never used it. FFP, I hope everybody realizes that FFP does not do anything to reverse uh, the anticoagulant effects of DOAC. It's like a drop in the ocean. You're just going to fluid overload your patient if you try to give FFP to reverse anticoagulant effect. Um, similarly, activated R7A, the effects are unclear as to whether or not it reverses uh, the anticoagulant activity. In vitro studies suggest that it does to varying depending on the concentration, but there's a concern because um, recombinant uh, factor 7A, Novo7, is a prothrombotic agent and can cause thrombosis, particularly in patients who are on an anticoagulant because they are prothrombotic. Four-factor PCC. Uh, in the United States, the only four-factor PCC is K-Centra. I've highlighted this in red because um, there's a huge debate about the, whether or not four-factor PCC can really reverse the anticoagulant effects of the 10A inhibitors. And I'm going to show you some new data that's just become available in the last three months um, that suggests that, yes, actually you can use four-factor PCC for the 10A inhibitors. Idaricizumab is the target-specific or targeted reversal agent for dabigatran. It's known as Praxbind. Um, it is a humanized monoclonal antibody fragment that binds to dabigatran with a 300-fold higher affinity for dabigatran than dabigatran has for thrombin. This was um, FDA-approved in October 2015, so just two years ago. Every patient who comes in with dabigatran who requires emergency surgery or urgent procedures or has life-threatening or uncontrolled bleeding gets the same 5-gram IV bolus dose. Um, this works. It works phenomenally well. We've used it in many occasions at Brigham and Women's Hospital. We've used it in 85-year-old women requiring urgent surgery for ischemic bowel. One dose, they go to the OR, the drains are still in. 24 hours later, they go back to the OR. We're, we're still doing great. Um, we've used it in intracranial hemorrhage, which is a little more difficult um, with regard to outcomes, and, and we can discuss that later. But basically, it works, and it works really well because once you give the um, uh, five gram bolus in two fractions of 2.5 grams, you get suppression of the anticoagulant effect immediately. This is the dilute thrombin time, which is a more sensitive way to measure uh, dabigatran effect on the coagulation system, and this is the mean dilute thrombin time. You can see that it goes below the normal range, and it stays down, it stays suppressed for over 12 and for the majority of patients over 24 hours. So one dose works phenomenally well. You've now gone through at least two more half-lives of dabigatran in people who have normal renal function. And this, that was data from the um, interim analysis, the first analysis of the first few patients um, in the idaricizumab uh, real-world trial, reverse AD. Um, this was the, the final um, results were published uh, just this summer. Overall, 503 patients were enrolled in reverse AD, which is the real-world study of using idaricizumab in patients who present to an emergency room facility uh, with bleeding and have had dabigatran on board. Um, one comment that I should make about uh, the reverse AD trial and the Indexanet trials and Nexa 4 is that these are not placebo-controlled trials. Um, none of these trials are going to have a placebo arm because we don't have good strategies for these patients who come in with urgent bleeding or requiring emergency surgery. Um, so the best we have is, is looking at the co prospectively uh, at the cohort and looking at surrogate endpoints with regard to reverse AD for what it did to lab uh, coagulation tests. And you can see that they're all suppressed, no matter what the, the type of uh, test was uh, used. Indexinat alpha is a different uh, target, uh, targeted agent to reverse the 10A inhibitors. Um, this is 
um, actually fascinating and I think uh, phenomenal genetics and biology. It used recombinant uh, technology. This is andexanat. This is native factor 10A that's activated. There's a mutation in the active site of andexanat, so it looks like factor 10A but has no catalytic activity and can't propagate thrombosis. It cannot participate in actively um, causing clot, but what it can do is bind those drugs, rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, and low molecular weight heparins, such as anoxaparin and even fondaparin. It can bind those drugs, take them out of the circulation, and decrease their anticoagulant effect. In other words, it's a universal factor 10A inhibitor antidote. The interim analysis of a similar real-world study was published uh, just over a year ago in August 2016. It is not yet approved for FDA use. Um, we are hoping to hear again now in February. So by February, we'll hear whether or not uh, Indexinet is available. Um, Anexa 4 is the real-world study of Indexinet um, being used now only in patients who present with bleeding. It's not designed and it's not being trialed in patients who need to go to the operating room or need urgent or emergent procedures um, because the um, drug has a very, very short half-life. So in order, if you could look at this uh, interim analysis results of uh, patients uh, who were treated with andexanet when they presented with apixaban or rivaroxaban-related bleeding or anoxaparin, this is the act, anti-factor 10A activity here on the Y um, in patients on rivaroxaban who were treated with indexinet or apixaban. And you can see that the baseline anti-factor 10A levels were appropriately elevated in these anticoagulated patients. When the patients received a bolus of indexinet, the uh, anticoagulant effect was uh, suppressed significantly. But you needed to give a two-hour continuous infusion after the bolus in order to maintain that suppression of anticoagulation. And that is where um, the study after publication in 2016 was refined and the dosing strategy for indexinet, um, the uh, parameters in the study were changed to increase the dose for those patients on apixaban um, or recently inge ingested uh, rivaroxaban. So notice I don't tell you the dose. It's got a complicated dosing scheme. We do hope it will be available uh, this uh, coming February. Um, we are participating in the trial at Brigham and Women's Hospital. If you have any questions, you can call us. Um, basically, in the real-world evaluation, so not only was an endpoint, uh, you know, reversal of the anticoagulant effect based on lab tests, but they also asked for subjective uh, analysis of hemostatic efficacy by those uh, physicians administering the drug. And you can see that overall, um, no matter what the uh, anticoagulant was, the gender, the site of bleeding, overall there were 75 to 80 percent of uh, patients received excellent or good hemostatic effect once they were treated uh, with andexanet. Now, the new data that I want to show um, goes back to um, whether or not we can actually use four-factor prothrombin complex concentrates to reverse the anticoagulant effect of factor 10A inhibitors. And part of the reason I'm so invested in this data is that there's an ongoing controversy uh, between two large partners' hospitals as to whether or not <laughs> it should be included. Uh, in At Brigham and Women's Hospital, we have uh, guidelines for reversing anticoagulant effect or for dealing with actively bleeding patients, and we will give four-factor PCC, which is Kcentra, to patients who have major uh, bleeding, intracranial bleeding, life-threatening GI hemorrhage, other, um, if they're taking a, a direct oral anticoagulant that's a 10A inhibitor. And so this data actually just came across my desk this morning in the Journal of Thrombosis Hemostasis. Um, it is a study of, uh, in 15 healthy subjects, um, uh, sponsored by Bristol-Myers Squibb. Uh, they took these uh, subjects they gave them apixaban uh, to steady state. They got four days of apixaban, and then they got two different types of uh, four-factor PCC. Only one of them is available in the U.S. Uh, they gave them high-dose apixaban, 
Uh, they gave 50 units per kilogram of the four-factor PCC. And then they looked at coagulation tests. And I'm sorry they're not so great here. But endogenous thrombin potential is suppressed when you're anticoagulated. And this curve right here is the apixaban-treated uh, subjects who were then treated with placebo versus two different types of four-factor PCC. And you can see that at the end of the infusion of the four PCC, there is clearly better uh, endogenous thrombin potential, better ability to form thrombin and form a clot in those patients treated with four-factor PCC than with placebo. Um, this uh, expands the timeline um, six hours, nine hours. Uh, right here is 24 hours. So you can see that from this data in healthy subjects, um, there definitely is a reversal effect, uh, at least on a pixaban, um, with four-factor PCC. Interestingly, despite that um, reversal of the anticoagulant effect, there was no change in the apixaban plasma concentration. So it did nothing to get rid of the drug from the circulation, like you might expect with a monoclonal antibody, um, like idarosizumab and dabigatran, but it was able to overcome the anticoagulant effect of apixaban. And the last piece of data that came out this summer, I think it was August or early September, was published in Blood by Sam Schulman and his colleagues. And this was a study, uh, prospective, real world, uh, observational study almost, of leading patients in Sweden who presented to hospitals, to emergency rooms with active bleeding and were treated with four-factor PCC at varying doses depending on the participating institutions. But overall, the median dose was roughly 2,000 units or 25 units per kilogram. And what they actually looked at, again, was sort of subjective um, assessments by the treating physicians as to whether or not there was effective hemostasis after giving four-factor PCC. And so you can see for intracranial hemorrhage, about 72% of uh, responding clinicians felt that it was effective, uh, 27 ineffective. Similarly, for GI um, bleeding with apixaban, um, there was greater than 50%, 60% uh, efficacy for four-factor PCC in stopping uh, bleeding with uh, the same numbers uh, for rivaroxaban. Now, it, like any of these studies, um, this was 83 patients. High mortality having to do with the fact that the patient was bleeding in the first place. Um, most of the fatalities were in patients who had intracranial hemorrhage, uh, which is to be expected. Um, the thrombotic risk is always something that's brought up, and that's usually felt to be that patients who present with severe bleeding and have reversal of the anticoagulant effect are usually then not restarted on anticoagulation. And somewhere during the hospitalization or the ensuing weeks, they have a, a thrombotic event. So um, in summary, uh, which is not on my summary slide, um, if you have a patient on dabigatran that's bleeding or needs to go to the emergency room, use idarosizumab. If you currently have somebody on a factor 10A inhibitor, adoxaban, rivaroxaban, apixaban, or batrixaban, you can use four-factor PCC um, to uh, reverse the anticoagulant effect with uh, 75-ish, 70 percent uh, efficacy. Now, one of the um, issues that Caitlin and I face, uh, not quite on a daily basis, is using these um, drugs. So the hemostatic antithrombotic stewardship that we work together on um, looks and oversees the use of the four-factor PCC Kcentra. And we find, you know, uh, services that have patients coming in for procedures, but the patient's not told that they shouldn't take their anticoagulant. In other words, they show up for their procedure and they're on the anticoagulant. And people want to use the four-factor PCC to reverse the anticoagulant effect and have the patient have surgery. That, in our mind, is not, at this stage of the game, is not a valid indication. These um, reversal agents, both idarosizumab and four-factor PCC, should be really um, reserved for those patients who have life-threatening bleeds, intracranial hemorrhage, uh, a critical organ, um, such as the eye, the spinal cord, or massive hemorrhage. People have life-threatening bleeds, and they're going to bleed to death unless something is done. Similarly, idarosizumab can be used for patients um, who require emergency surgery, um, 
Um, we've had a number of cases um, where we've had patients go to the OR for AAA repair um, in, in an urgent fashion uh, for ischemic bowel, as I mentioned, for other um, procedures, and it works quite well. Um, we do not endorse using these antidotes now or in when indexin it's available or in the near future for elective surgery or surgery uh, that can be delayed. For patients who have elevated coagulation tests, um, potentially high levels of uh, plasma concentration of drug, but they are not bleeding, you can carefully follow these patients. Um, you don't need to do anything. Or for patients who are bleeding, that can be managed um, with routine supportive measures. So despite the fact that we have these agents and despite the fact that they can really reverse anticoagulant effect um, in, the, in vitro, in, in laboratory-based coagulation tests, we see 70 to 80 percent efficacy based on clinical assessments. The real question is, um, will these reversal agents improve bleeding outcomes? And I think that's the part that is going to be really hard to get a handle on. You know, stopping ICH makes intuitive sense. If you've got somebody who presents on a Pixaban and they have an intracranial hemorrhage, it makes sense to reverse the anticoagulant. Will it really impact the outcome is, is not clear at this time. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thanks.